Alright guys, welcome to Team Liquid against YGosu.com. This is Joe from Team Liquid, and I'm joined today with uh, Plexa, also from Team Liquid. Hi everyone, it's Plexa, first time here, so should, games are going to be pretty good, trust me. Yeah, uh, I think Plexa has somehow reached uh, through the fabric of time and already knows the result of this somehow. While uh, I'm coming in, I don't know the result. I can only imagine we got destroyed, but uh, we'll have to see what ha happens. Don't worry, Chill, you will not be disappointed. Alright, I'm going to hold that to you. So we've got game one here. Uh, I believe is Jianfei. Jianfei against... Yun Fu? I don't even know how to pronounce that, but it's going to be a PVT on Python. Yes, that's right, Chill. Um, Yun Fu, he kind of turned up a bit early for the 3v3, which kind of failed miserably due to lag issues. Um, during the Korean cast of this, we managed to get CHR actually along. Most of you guys will know him from his uh, Air Force time, where he managed to beat Visu on uh, Monty Hall in one of the epic games of 2007. And he ended up lagging most of the cast, so most of these games were played under lag conditions, so might explain a bit of the sloppy micro here and there. <laughs> Alright, um, I think if foreigners were going to get it done, PVT on Python, I mean it's so standard and, and simplistic, I think that's something that favors us, but you, I mean looking on the other side of the spectrum, also being so standard uh, and this being pro gamers, uh, it's something they're really comfortable with as well. Uh, but I really think, uh, you know, JF, the top foreigner, won the TSL. You've got to expect him to come in well, especially in you know a somewhat simplistic matchup like PVT on an easy map like Python. I'm really expecting big things from JF here. Well, well I was talking to JF before the matchup actually, and he wasn't too confident on Python. Why? Don't actually know. I mean. He's got all the things working in his favor, I mean, it's not exactly a bad PVT map and all that, but he just doesn't like the map for PVT, so I'm interested to see what he'll, he'll do here. Alright, let's not delay this anymore, let's get this started, see what happens in game one. So right off the bat, we've got cross positions here. The Terran uh, for Y goes to Yun Fu uh, spawning at the 12 o'clock position in red Terran. Jeff spawning at the 6 o'clock position in kind of a, uh, a beige Protoss here. Cross positions, very good uh, for Protoss and PVT. It means all the rushes from Terran come that much slower. Uh, it means you can expand that much easier. I mean, the only thing that's, that works against Jeff is if we get in sort of a split map situation or... or if JF wants to open one base Reavers, this isn't the time to do it, but everything else looking in JF's uh, favor thus far. Oh, definitely. Cross positions on Python is pretty much your dream as a Protoss. I mean, you know, everything's going to be working in his favor. I mean, it works with the Stork style so well, like the two get the two base into Reaver and the, into the harassment. So it's all going to be working in JF's favor as long as he plays at least semi-standard. Although Ian Fo is uh, notorious for his anti-Reaver play, so... It should be interesting how this is going to turn out, your Reaver Master versus your Reaver Defender. Yeah, I, I gotta think that JF is not going to open up Reavers just because it, it seems very risky against a pro gamer. Uh, I would expect to see a lot of cheese in this show match from the foreigners, I mean, it seems to be the smart thing to do. Uh, you, you would also think that the pro gamers would open with very safe anti-cheese style. So again, uh, another way of thinking is maybe they'll play too defensively. I can take advantage of that, play a little uh, aggressively right in the open, play a little risky, and then look to take it to late game with a big advantage. See JF uh, playing standard thus far, pylon gateway going, scouting right away, and oh, a wall coming from uh, Terran. So again, playing very safe thus far. Yeah, the mentality of most of the foreign team here was to come out and play safe, play standard, and try to get into a nice, decent game. A lot of these guys think that, you know, we can actually match these guys if we play our very best. And I mean, that's a good mentality to come into this, especially since the Koreans are likely playing slightly safe on this matchup. Yeah, for sure. And someone like Nooney, I mean, he showed really good results against, uh, you know, B-class pro gamers. 
or I, I suppose Seer D class pro gamers, but you know, he does have some wins against them with just standard play, and I mean, they do come in underestimating us. We see uh, Terran putting up a, a cute little trick here, starting that depot, canceling it, and then going back to the barracks just to seal that wall, and that's something I haven't seen since uh, the Lost Temple days, really, but when it was really popular back then, but just a cute little trick uh, if you're up to something, or if you want to keep Protoss guessing, even if you're playing standard, I mean, it just seals that off, and now Protoss is playing blind. Yeah, I mean, I think Ian here is really trying to just keep it so that JF can't do anything at all here. So once he's got that wall up, there's nothing JF can do. He's just got to sit outside and maybe hit that SCP a few times like he's doing right now. Uh, yeah, there goes the probe. Poor little guy. So, yeah, I mean, Ian's playing nice and safe, so he should be fine. And JF is still playing in the dark, which isn't going to be working too well for him, I'd imagine. Yeah, not much to add here. We see a single factory, uh, two SCVs on gas, so that is kind of indicative of a siege expand. Actually, one got pulled off now, so it could be a siege expand, it could be some sort of FD, but uh, fast expansion is going to be the theme here from the Terran, or else we'd see more SCVs on the gas uh, if he was going for some sort of two-fact build. Single Dragoon coming from JF, range not started. He's saving up quite a bit of minerals and gas, so possibly a robo. Yeah, actually, if you look over at the... If you look over at the 3 o'clock main, we've got JF starting a pile on now. So, obviously, JF's here not content to play standard, which is quite surprising, really. That pylon is really late, though. If he was looking to put up some tech, it, that pylon should have been done long ago, and the tech should be going up now. And and he should be faking something on his cyberdynamic score. I mean, with this SCV in his base, seeing one gateway, one dragoon, nothing coming out of the core, he's going to know something is up. And uh, this robo is coming in very late. Jeff saved up a lot of minerals uh, before putting that down. So I really think uh, the Terran player is going to see something coming. He's putting up a command center, and uh, I'm going to expect to see an eBay going up very shortly. Yeah, especially from someone like Ian, who's so used to dealing with the Reavers. He should be putting up some kind of defense or having something ready for this. I mean, this game's really going to be decided about how good JF can control his Reaver, and we know that's pretty well, but how good is that going to be against the Koreans? Yeah, exactly. I mean, JF is just a king of Reavers at the, the foreigner level, but what's, this is, we're talking about pro gamers here. I mean, Jeff really, his control is not at the pro gamer level, so this is going to be something that uh, the Terran is really comfortable of playing against. And uh, you know, I really don't like uh, how Jeff has played this thus far. I, I think it's really obvious if he was going to go for faint, he should have put a little more into it. Maybe put up another building and then canceled it. It's got to be something really committed to, I believe. I don't think this is really really going to get it done against Terran. But you know, pro gamers have off days, and they're not used to. Get used to playing against foreigners. He could just chalk it up to, you know, this foreigner is bad, his timing is bad, his production is bad, he missed a few rounds, maybe that's that's what he's thinking, and maybe this Reaver will come in. That's a very real possibility, but what we've got here is we've got Ian now scouting out, looking for something, so I think he knows that there's the possibility of something, something fishy gum. And inside his main, he's actually started his eBay quite early, so I think he knows that there's probably something that's going to be happening soon. I mean, JF's got the three dragoons outside his natural now, so he should be able to stop that SCV from getting in and seeing if there's actually a natural there or not, but... He sh Eon seems pretty prepared for this, and that's what I'd expect from him, really. Yeah, Jeff, uh, I don't know if he has a follow-up plan here. He's not really saving enough minerals for an expansion. He's got Goon Rage done, making a bunch of Dragoons. It, the, I don't know if his mentality is to finish this, or if it's kind of a safe opening into an expansion. He's got a probe now at his natural, looking to expand. Here comes the SCV to 3 o'clock. It's probably going to scout uh, this robotics, and once he confirms that it's Reavers, that's going to be a lot of trouble for Jeff. You see the eBay lifted now, turrets going up, a tank back. Jeff is going to have a ton of problems here, and he's going to be way behind going to the mid-game, unless this Reaver has some heroic scarabs, which I just really don't think it's going to at this point. Actually, I think that SCV just missed that part there, the, the proxy robo and whatnot. And here comes the shuttle now, moving across into the main. He's picked up a Dragoon, and hopefully that turret under there doesn't do too much damage to it, and the shuttle comes in, comes in, and oh, that turret's going to scare it away, not quite nicely. That Marine's going to prove quite pissily. Oh, Eon's got like three turrets around here right now, so he's pretty safe from the three for harass. There's tanks everywhere, and looks like that Reaver ain't going to be doing much damage today. Yeah, I think JF is so far behind, I think it would have been worthwhile to drop that Dragoon and just take a few shots at the Scarab. I don't think 
uh, holding the Terran back is really what JF wants to do here. He's not really overexpanding. He's got nothing he's waiting for here. He needs to deal damage. And here he comes. He's going to drop the Reaver. Actually, not drop the Dragoon. Scarab goes off. Is it going to hit? Oh, it looks like it's glitched. Oh, it's not going to go off. So that is not going to do damage. Jeff needs to get a few more of those and actually take out some SCVs at this point, or else he's just going to get steamrolled going through into the mid game. Yeah, but I don't think that's going to happen anymore. Those tanks are very well sieged, and I don't think Jeff is actually going to seriously consider going back. Losing the river at this point would just be adding the final nails into his coffin. He's already at a very bad position, and even though he really does need to get in there and hit something, it just won't happen with that many turrets and those many tanks sitting around defending. But I mean, yeah, exactly. Look at his natural. His natural is not even up yet. Uh, Yun or Yun, however you want to pronounce his name, has been mining for quite some time uh, at his natural. He's ramped up to four factories at this point. He's uh, secure in his main. The Reaver's not going to be doing anything. Jeff needs another base, and he needed it about five minutes ago. So really, at this point, it's it's very early to call. But I, the game is all but over for JF. I mean, the supplies are pretty much even uh, with four factories for Terran and only four gateways for JF. So he, he really needs a Terran to do something disastrous. And here comes the SCV, or the Reaver, just going to pick up that building SCV, try to do some harassment, but there's not much that can be done at this point. Uh, Terran looks very secure in his main. Basically, what Jeff's really got to do now is either find that there's this little spot up in the top of, his, of Eon's main which he's got to hit with his Reaver, which is very unlikely to happen. The more likely alternative for him to come back is for Ian to push out and stuff it up really badly, come out with a poor position and have JF come up with a major unit advantage. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm really surprised JF didn't fish around in the main, check the north end and, and try to take some shots. I mean, he's had, had that Dragoon in there. Uh, so he really could have dropped that, fired some scarabs at the SCVs, but at this point it's too late. Quick control there from Moon, uh, moving the SCV back from the Reaver Scarab, actually. Very nice. And uh, looks like he's unseaging all his tanks and uh, getting both Vulture upgrades coming. He's going to have up the Vulture Rally and moving out with a ton of tanks. Uh, yeah, JF in a lot of trouble at this point. Stalling for leg speed, but it's not even 50% at this point. Yeah, this is pretty much the moment of truth for JF right here. I mean, he's really got to stop this push and not suffer any major unit damage to have any sort of chance in this game. Yeah, and JF knows it. I mean, he didn't take a third base, which would have been disastrous. He's just trying to build up his units uh, so he can uh, maximize his army size at this one critical battle and hoping, you know, that Un will make a mistake and then he can move in and, uh, you know, take back map control and move on to a third base. But of course, you know, Un being a pro gamer level is not going to make that mistake. He's playing safe, scouting properly. I mean, look at all these red dots. Three SCVs in the middle of the map, scouting around for uh, JF's army, scouting around for a third base. And now he realizes what's happening, moving his uh, tank vulture army through the middle. JF going to look to meet him, but uh, leg speed not done yet. It's at about 95%. This is going to be the critical battle here. Uh, JF is going to have to pull off something magical. Tank siege. Here comes a Reaver dropping in the back. Uh, he's going to get a scare. He gets targeted, actually. Scarab goes off, doing a lot of damage. But JF coming in trying to flank. There's not enough vultures. Looks like Jeff is actually going to clean this up. That is very surprising. That is exactly what he needs to get back in the game. We look at t take a look at the supplies. Terran now down to 75. Jeff at 90. He needs to take a third base now, and he may be, be back in this game, actually. Yeah, that was quite impressive down by Jeff there. I mean, he's got his third base up well, building now, and I mean, he's just really got to play the perfect game now. Play defensive, not let the vulture harass get to him, and he's got a, a decent shot at coming back into this game. Yeah, that was really surprising. That was a sloppy push from Terran not rallying the vultures. Those vultures that are back here laying mines really needed to be right in front of the tanks, setting up uh, a minefield to help uh, defend against the zealots. We see the vultures moving in the bottom right. Of course, nothing doing there. Single probe. Vultures moving to the natural. Uh, zealots going to try to come back and clean that up. Uh, yep, the vulture just doing a, a little bit of harassment. No big deal. JF's got a pylon wall set up at uh, 9 o'clock. Uh, so yeah, he's doing pretty decent to come back into this game. I'm really surprised that that push got crushed that easily. Uh, hopefully JF can keep up his macro, secure 9 o'clock, and get back in this game. I, th I mean, I think it's still to feel like he's behind at this point, but he's got you know a lot brighter outlook at this point than he did you know five minutes ago. Oh, definitely. JF's way behind in this game, and he really does need to play perfectly and maybe have Eon screw up once more. I mean, that's a very real possibility. I mean, we were talking with some of the gamers beforehand, 
And apparently Ian is no longer a programmer. He was, I believe, on Eastro. I could be wrong, but he is no longer on any pro team, so he's just the next pro. He's still got the experience behind him, but it may explain the sloppy push. Oh, okay. Yeah, that does change things a little bit. See, Vulture's come in, turned away by three pylons and a gateway, so that is, that is tight against uh, Vulture Harass. JF coming in with his army, trying to clean up these uh, harassing Vultures. And looks like uh, that's exactly what Dune wanted, moving in with Vultures, trying to flank around. But that gets cut off as well. JF doing well. Oh, no. oh he's oh, running no. the probes into the oh, Vultures. No, the Dear probes God. Is Not that what we terrible. wanted to see. Here come some more probes. Oh no, they're just gonna run straight into those vultures. Oh no, oh, no. oh my god, they're just getting slaughtered out there. This is not what JF needs. He's really behind now, and the game is virtually out of his grasp. I mean, Eon's up to two bases, he's got five fac running, he's in a very, very bad position right now. Yeah, I thought JF was handling that vulture harass nicely, but uh, I, I thought the point of the vultures was to draw JF's army left and then and then move right. And look at these vultures running into the natural now, laying some mines, trying to flank around. Dragoon's not reacting properly, uh, gonna eat a lot of mines here, and that's gonna leave the vultures. Oh, JF putting up pylon walls everywhere, uh, doing nice to, to try to defend, but still taking you know significant losses. And where he should have defended that a little more cleanly. Two vultures still going to work back there, and JF, I mean. He's just getting his disadvantage compounded here by eating all these probe losses from these vultures. Now vultures gonna go back to nine o'clock again, maybe trying to uh, pull the boxer jump. I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah, this is, vulture control has been pretty good so far. I'd imagine. I mean, Jeff defended that last harass pretty well with that, that impromptu pylon wall there, but still he took a number of unit losses to make that thing. And those vultures are heading over there at nine o'clock, trying to take out that pylon. While the other vultures are mining up, trying to stall those goons and everything. They probably will be able to be stalled for long enough, but those vultures will probably not be able to break through that wall in time, but a uh, subsequent round of vultures probably will. In the meantime, we've seen that the Terran has taken his third at the mineral only expansion, and is sieging it up now with tanks. I mean, the Eon's really playing well, and he's getting his macro game on, and he should be fine. And yes, those last two vultures didn't manage to crack that, that pylon. I mean, it's still got 185 HP, so... Subsequent round of vultures should be able to clear that out. Mm, Jeff needs a fourth base. I mean, but his options are limited at this point. He's he's got map control somewhat, but the vultures are still being very effective. So he probably wouldn't want to take bottom right, open himself up to to three points of vulture harassment. And I mean, taking the nine o'clock main just is really close to this Terran push. Uh, so I really feel bad for Jeff. Looks like he's decided to respond by taking uh, a completely different option, taking the mineral only. Uh, so only six patches there, each of them only got a thousand. Uh, I think the island might have been another option which Jeff didn't explore. Uh, probably a better one. He's got two reavers in this shuttle, uh, no speed on the shuttle, and the shuttle's not really doing anything too effective. Vulture's now coming to 9 o'clock yet again and gonna knock on that door, try to take that pylon down. Jeff's pretty quick coming back, gonna clean that up pretty easy. Yeah, well, as if you see right now, the JF still got a unit count advantage, although it's not anything substantial to give him any kind of cushion room to do anything bad. But you know, he's still got a, he's got a, still got an outside chance. And here we go. We see the vultures trying to take out that pylon, and will they take it? Will they take it? And no, I think those dragoons are going to come in and clear things up. And even if they did take it, JF's managed to uh, warp in a pi another pylon on a forge, so those vultures will be pretty much useless. And oh, and here we got some vultures coming into the natural. There's only four zealots there, and they should die to those mines. Oh no, this is very bad for JF right here. And those vultures are coming in, and oh no, he's main arting the, the probes over, and oh dear, he's just lost about three, four, five. Oh, and if vultures manage to jump over the pylon wall thanks to the probe glitching, those vultures are doing a massive amount of damage, and JF is in a real bad situation right now. Even worse than he was before, if that was imaginable. And those vul and more vultures are coming over to 9. There's vultures everywhere, killing probes in all sorts of places. This is crazy. Yeah, JF really should have defended this a little better. Uh, these, these vultures cleaning everything up. Let's take a look at the supplies. JF barely pushing 150, and you uh, going to be max pretty soon. He's got a drop chip out now. He's sitting at 180 supply. Uh, he'll probably max out keep his upgrades going and look to push. He's not researching plus one armor actually. I thought he would push out at 1-1. Looks like he's just going to max up and push out. Uh, these tanks going to be dropped at 9 o'clock. That's going to shut that down. and That's going to shut down any hope JF had really of, of winning this game. Vultures just attack moving 9 o'clock, taking out a lot of uh, Dragoons, laying some mines there. Here comes the dropship and uh, 
Looks like the dropship is actually going to put the tanks at the at the ridge to support the vultures over here. This is a very strange play. A uh, bit of an elevator going on. Jeff responding with uh, reavers and a shuttle of his own. That's probably going to be able to take that out, but how many probes is Jeff going to lose in the meantime? Looks like he hasn't been able to respond in Maynard. Those, those are all going down to these four uh, vultures. Every probe going to be lost here at 9 o'clock, and that's really going to seal it. Jeff is going to lose this game, and really strong play shown by, uh, by Yin in, uh, in this first game. Yeah, I mean, Inn's just making this even worse. I mean, he's going to take the top lift. The, vo the dropship's going to come over and drop in the main, and he's going to lose even more pros. I mean, any hope JF still had in this game is now firmly faded away. And I guess, what can we say about game one? Uh, I think I think mechanics, uh, We obviously we have to give the advantage to the ex-pro gamer, but I don't think there was, you know, that much of a disparity to uh, take all hope away from foreigners. I think the big problem for JF at least was that his build was late and it was a bad build. It was a bad idea. Uh, he, he didn't really get into the mind games of it to, to really fake out in to make it effective and then once that reaver uh, proved to be ineffective he didn't uh, do it, you know, he couldn't really get back into the game. So here comes the final push. Storm's going off. Uh, gonna do uh, some nice damage there but I mean it's, it's all for naught. So just an attack move from Karen, if I've ever seen one. That's going to steamroll over Jeff, and that's going to be game one to uh, Why Gosu. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, the r only real discrepancy between JF and Ian here was the fact that JF just couldn't handle the Vulture Harass, which was really disappointing considering his, his status. I mean, after that first push, things evened out quite a bit, and if those Vultures hadn't come in and intercepted oh, 12, 15 probes, then, you know, JF could have taken his fourth easily and things would have gone much better for him. For the majority of that last game anyway, um, JF was ahead in unit count, so I mean, JF is macroing on par with at least the B-teamers or XB-teamers. So that's a reassuring sign for us foreigners, so we may actually see a game stolen here today. Alright, next up we've got the 2v2 on Hunters. I mean, uh, before the game, Testy was protesting quite profusely about Hunters and how bad it is for 2v2 because it doesn't have a ramp. So we'll see if Testy can hold up to that. And as most of you should know by now, uh, Nazgul had to drop out of this at the last moment because he had route issues and could not play in team games. So Testy was taking his place. So this team for Team Liquid will be our good friend Testy and our beloved moderator, Insane. On top of that, we've got Waigusu coming up, and they have sent a very, very scary lap. We've got Choya Kao coming out, who is a ex-pro gamer, and we have 182A3A4, who is basically Terra Fo, one of the most notorious micro mutilist harassers of all time. I'm actually surprised with a name like that, he plays Zerg. That is like the definitive Protoss nickname, if I've ever seen it. And uh, can we just confirm, did Testy choose random in this match, or did he go Zerg? I believe he chose to play Protoss. Really, double Protoss and Hunters, that is not a good idea. He may have random, but I can't remember. I don't think I was in this game. Ah, no, he played random because he is now playing Terran. Oh god. <laughs> Not a good thing you want to see uh, Terran and Protoss against Protoss and Zerg. Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, you really want to be playing uh, Protoss, Protoss, or Protoss, Zerg, or even Zerg, Zerg, but Protoss, Terran? That's just not good. <laughs> Yeah, so just to clear up, uh, the Team Liquid team is going to be uh, Testy, Red Terran at 12 o'clock, and uh, h &R Insane, uh, the Blue Protoss at 9 o'clock, and they're going to be against 1A2A3A uh, Pou, uh, who is at top right in Purple Zerg, and uh, Choya Kal, who is uh, Orange Protoss in bottom right. So, no, I, I'm not too sure how the positional disadvantages work in Hunters. Obviously, closer positions are favorable, and uh, the double choke positions are favorable, but it looks like they're both uh, 
fairly equidistant to the center. I think the positional advantage would play a little to Team Liquid's favor. I think they're closer together, uh, almost sharing a choke, and Tessie has a double choke. But of course the racial disadvantage is huge, uh, given that they have a Terran on their team. Yeah, I mean, Terra, uh, otherwise known as 102A3A, is going to 9-pool, and well, he is 9-pooling. And I mean, that's not going to work well for Tessie. That's going to put him out of the action for quite a while, because he's so close to Terra. Meanwhile, that should counterbalance the fact that Choya is so far away from the action. So, while we have the positional advantage with Insane and Testy being really close, we do have a huge racial advantage and we won't be able to play off that positional advantage. Yeah, so a, a 9 pool speed coming from uh, 1A to A3A. We can see Insane uh, went for a 10-12 gate, uh, and Choya is also going to 10-12 gate. Uh, Insane is known for having incredible timings, incredible production, and macro. Uh, I would expect to see his production, if he doesn't get screwed up, to be on par with Choya all game. Uh, it's just incredible to watch him just make zealots on hunters. It's, it seems like such a silly thing, but he never misses a production round, never misses a probe, and his zealot micro is really second to none in the foreigner scene. Yeah, I would definitely say that Insane is one of the, if not the best, oh no, he's probably not the best, there are others. He's one of the best B BGH players out there, I mean, he, his macro is, as you said, absolutely phenomenal, never misses anything, and he comes out there with more units than the programmers sometimes, I mean, Troya will, is actually behind him right now, I mean, Insane's gateways are slightly faster, and I'd expect that to continue because Insane's map is Hunters. There is no way that anyone outside of Korea is going to have an easy time beating Insane, or inside for that matter. Yeah, for sure. Here come the uh, first six Zerglings headed toward Tessie. He's got a bunker. It looks to be timed a little slow, but uh, he's got a good SCV block, so he'll be safe from that. He's gonna hop in the bunker, and uh, that'll shut that down right away. So good play there. He's got his second barracks up, going to be able to produce now. And it uh, looks like 1A283 is not responding as expected uh, with continual, uh, continual production and mining gas and hunting towards lair. He's actually getting a second uh, hatchery, continuing to produce uh, zerglings. Zealots from uh, Choya now joining with uh, 1A283, heading towards Insane. He's got three zealots out, two more making, and a uh, third gateway coming. So he'll have to really have tip-top micro to be able to defend this since Testy is all but out of the game. I mean, he's hiding in his bunker until he's safe enough to move into the center. Yeah, I mean, uh, you have to remember that this game was played under laggy conditions, and it's kind of lagging right now, but still, I mean, it, micro under these circumstances is, is fairly difficult. And I mean, as you can see now, Troya is starting to build cannons right outside Testy's main, and he's effectively going to separate the two players in half. And this is going to allow Troya and terror to basically run free all over the map because they can just 2v1 anyone they want. Yeah, and it looks like Tessie just now catching wind of it. He scouted that with his SCV, so at least he knows it's coming. I don't know if the proper response to that is going to be, you know, more barracks and uh, just a big eventual m and push, or tanks. I mean, both options seem pretty weak, and uh, really insane just getting picked apart here. Uh, Zergling's running in, killing pylons, and then, you know, targeting around, flanking two groups, picking off Zealots, Insane just really, really getting picked apart here, and I've got to blame this on the laggy conditions, unfortunately, because Insane's micro uh, probe Zealot against Zergling is really fantastic, so it's really unfortunate he can't show that off in this match. Yeah, another thing severely hampering him is the fact that Testy is so isolated. I mean, Testy really has to kick it into a macro here right now and, and try and make up for this, because it's very likely that Insane will not be able to hold this off. I mean, you've got 2v1 right now, and TSD just can't do anything. So he's really got to say, I don't know, expand right now, or something like that, to get himself up into a position where he can actually 1v2 these guys. I don't even know what that position is, really. Insane getting uh, just basically attack moved here. He's only got two zealots left in probes against quite a few zealots in Zergling, so that's really going to finish him off. Testy now got medics out, but there are four, five, six, seven cannons, eight cannons. Uh, that's a pylon, so seven cannons, and he really only has about seven marines, so that's not going to work too well. I'm trying to put up a factory, but it's really just going to come too late. As soon as Zerg switches over to Mutalis, and uh, Protoss gets an expansion, there's really, really nothing Tusky is going to be able to do two-on-one on Hunters. Yeah, basically right now, what we're looking for from Testy is to try to get him somehow back into this game. 
I mean, it looks like his SCP count isn't as healthy as we'd like it to be. Terror soon will be getting to Lair Tech, or possibly, probably Spire Tech. Insane is effectively out of this game, and Troya is now taking his gas, so he'll be looking to Tech as well. It'll be interesting to see how Troya plays out with his advantage. I mean, there is a chance he could um, try expanding and overexpand, or something like that, and give Testy a window to get back into this with a nice timing push against Terra, but well, in all reality, that's not very likely. And as we see right now, we've got Terra ticking up to Lair, so likely we'll see Spire very, very soon. Yeah, I mean, you're trying to make it exciting, uh, understandably, but this game is all but <laughs> over. <laughs> Look, even with all yeah, the Yeah, pretty much over. The time yep, that Testy is going to much spend over. making a tank siege and unsiege, and then by that time, you know, nine mutilists are just going to snipe it. There's really nothing that Tessie can do, and I don't know why he went Terran or why he went random. Really, it makes no sense why we, we didn't send out a Protoss Zerg on this map, in my eyes. Yeah, I don't know why Tessie chose to random instead of Zerg as well, but still. Highlights that we could possibly see, we could see Terra cranking out some of that fantastic Muta Micro. It's a possibility. We could see, I don't know, Choya rip out some mind control. It's a possibility. Uh, yeah, not much else to look forward to. I mean, Testy is, is playing an impossible game in all reality, because, you know, we're dealing with programmers here. I mean, Terra, one of the best Zergs in, in, the, for, in the B teamers. I mean, we got Choya, I mean, ex programmer. There's really nothing Testy can do right now. Yeah, Spire at uh, 200 HP. Testy could have some good timing on turrets. He's got an eBay up, so he might get be able to get turrets sometime, but I mean, it's really not going to matter all that much. Tank finally out, and here comes an A move from uh, Zealot and Zergling trying to get that tank down. Looks like Testy has really good positioning. The tank going to get targeted now, it's going to get taken out. But uh, I imagine a second tank will be made pretty quickly. So I mean, Testy really got the better of that that attack. But if you look at the supplies, Testy at 50, Zerg at 20, Protoss at 25. So I mean, he's ahead of both of them. But just the way 2v1, I mean, both of them combined. But the way 2v1 works is, you know, the the whole is great greater than the sum of the parts. So uh, Testy really has lost his game, and we're just yeah, waiting for well, some nice Muta Micro to finish him off. One thing that you're forgetting is that Choya does have about 15 odd cannons now which don't contribute to the supply count, so Testy is very, very well and truly contained. So at oh, this and, time uh, we can... Oh, we can give ahead. you an IC Cup update. Yeah, um, apparently they're having issues. They're having issues and they'll be back online within the next few hours, so you might as well stay here. <laughs> I like how the countdown was, why so serious? Wow, thanks Icy Cup, that's so great. Yeah, just like them to, you know, hype it all up for a few technical difficulties. God, what, okay, what was that SC2GG thing too? There was like zealots on the front page for a week, and then they were just gone and nothing happened. What the hell was that? What is with these websites? Like, you can't just hype something up and then not do it. That's stupid. Yeah, um... I believe they had an idea and then they kind of flopped out on it. And here we have Terra coming in with his Mutalisk, so this should be fun. If not rape, but still. A yeah, nice micro here, wow. Yeah, I mean, this is just a tribute to the fact that Terra is just so good with his Mutalisks. I mean, he only had about three or four, and he was taking out a good number of Marines. I actually, I think there's about six. There's more coming now, but Testy's really fighting impossible battle. I mean, coming back to you know SC to GG and all, all their hype. I mean, if you, you can't hype something up and then just not do anything, that's just not ethical. I mean, you know, when we hyped up the TSL, it's like, you know, we hyped this up for two weeks. You know, we're gonna deal with something huge here. And I mean, when you got people coming up and like, oh no, we got technical difficulties, or oh no, we just decided not to do it anymore. That, that's 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 like a kick in the balls, man. Yeah, so to all the foreigner sites, how about you actually finish your project and then start hyping it? Because doing it the other way is not working out, obviously. And something I'm really liking here is Choya taking five bases. That's what I would do. Uh, that's pretty fantastic. He's got, what is he have? Five Nexus and uh, 40 supply? That, that's just wonderful. Yeah, Choya's really taking the piss out of Testy right now. Oh, and uh, Raokun's come up and said that. 
the ECTGG project was endurance. So I guess they did do something after all. <laughs> was it? What? No, because endurance was already running when they put the zealots up. Oh, well, I guess that settles it. Was it a, like a rhetorical question? Why are the zealots so happy? No one knows. I don't know. What does that have to do with endurance? I, I have no idea. I mean, they did get seven nil by us, so what can you say about them? <laughs> Damn. They're just too easy a target, really. Yeah, kind of like how badly we're getting raped in this game. <laughs> yeah, I guess we got hit with a ball of our own shit, if you know what I mean. Like, what do we even talk about? This is just Testy waiting to this die. Is, this is just Testy trying to kill off some Dark Templar, try to survive some mutilus harass. <laughs> While Choya takes half the map with Nexuses. Yeah, this is awesome. He can support his army like just on Nexuses. He doesn't need he doesn't need pylons. The one thing that this game needs now is a complete probe mass by Choya, and then just to come in and rape all of Tissy's Marines with probe micro. Hey, you know that plugin that someone made for Chaos Launcher where you can take over replays at some point? Yeah, that one, the safe state thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we should do that. I'll be Joy. <laughs> that should be fun. Sometimes we should do that to broadcast. Can, GTR can be testy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go mascot. Woo! Oh man, these mutas are brutal. Like brutal in the sense that I would not want to be playing against them because they're so good. Yeah, so, in the meantime, we will actually get to see Terra again. I mean, I believe he's playing Cloud next on Andromeda, so hopefully we'll see some Mutalist versus Protoss. So, that should be something to look forward to. Oh, a line I was supposed to say a long time ago that I forgot to was, Testy is choked off worse than d Knight." So Tessie trying to take an expand about 12 minutes into this game. That's just way too late by any standards. And Choya is now up to seven days. Man, Choya is awesome. He's a great guy. We'll actually see him again as well. I think. I believe he's playing against Machine. Oh, actually, actually, Machine versus Choya is next. So we've got Mr. Nexus versus our resident. American Zerg. I'm really excited about that match actually because Machine has like kind of been up and coming for a while so I really want to see if he can prove himself. Testy finally saying GG. Finally. Finally he taps out. So not much to say about that game except for confirmation of why you play Proto Zerg on Hunters and I don't know who's running this match but whoever put in not a Zerg I would like to talk to you ASAP. Yeah, that was me, actually. What the hell are you doing? Well, originally we had a PV team, and that wouldn't have been too bad if we got the right positions, but Nazwell dropped out, and then Testy stepped up, and I was like, okay, sweet, Testy's gonna play Zerg, and he random. <laughs> and that happened. At least Testy's got one more chance to redeem himself, so we'll ho hopefully that will go better. Hopefully, but after that, I'm not so confident. Okay, so as you said, this is going to be a ZBP on Blue Storm with uh, Machine against Troya. Really, I think this is one of the one of the big matches I was looking forward to in this event. I really hope Machine can put something together big in this game. Yeah, I was surprised to see how little hype this and attention this received in comparison to like JF versus uh, um, Eon and Cloud versus Terra. I mean. They're big names, but still. This this should be one of the better matches of So we've got Machine in the top right as Orange Zerg, we've got Choya in the bottom left as Blue Protoss, and I mean being Blue Storm I mean at this point Blue Storm has been solved. It's there's not so much of an advantage to Zerg 
as there used to be, but there's still a slight advantage, and I think Zerg always feels comfortable playing on Blue Storm. Specifically, they have the options of the run-by. It's, it's the famous Zergling run-by map. Uh, so I, I think any Zerg feels comfortable playing ZBP on this map, and I think playing against a pro gamer or ex-pro gamer, comfort is really something you need at that point. So hopefully Machine uh, feels comfortable here and plays well. Actually, I'm not so sure about that. If you look up on TLPD for the Blue Storm stats for pro gaming, you'll see that it's about 50% for each. But then if you take it back and actually look at just Blue Storm 1.2, so that's from about April 1st of this year, then you see that Protoss actually has a 66% win rate against Zerg, and I mean, that's substantial. Something definitely happened. Protoss solved this map, and now they're, they're winning a lot of the time against Zerg, which was actually kind of surprising given the initial imbalance towards Zerg. Yeah, but if you look at the Foreigner stats, it's actually reversed because Zerg is actually stronger than Protoss in the Foreigner scene. So, I mean, maybe they both feel comfortable, yeah, well, that's but true. The, the pro gamers are clearly going to feel comfortable against Foreigners, regardless of map. So, I think that's anything true, that's that true. gives comfort to Foreigners is, is something we can take uh, a yeah. bit of comfort with. Yeah, this, this is Machine's map. He was specifically requested Blue Storm, and so he's got exactly what he wanted. So... That should be at least a little bit of comfort to him. And as expected, doing an overpool run by, or overpool speed, we'll have to see if it's a run by. We can only imagine at this point. And, I mean, things aren't the same as they used to be in the Mondragon 42 and 0 days, or 42 and 1 days. I think uh, Protosses are a lot uh, wiser against this build, so it's not going to be, you know, free win as it used to be, but still a strong opening and really comes down to how uh, the Zerg player just decides to follow up on it and decides to execute it. I hope Machine uh, can do well with this, with his run by. Choya is opting to build his Nexus first, which is... I don't know, I, I suppose it's safe given the, the distance across this map and the Ling's just building now. And we should see him adding one, possibly two, maybe three later cannons. And here comes the first one now, right next to his Nexus, so he'll be, he should be safe from this. And Machine getting his natural blocked, um, opting to, to start Zergling Speed now, trying to get his natural up. Uh, I'm not sure, of the, there's kind of two builds. You can do uh, the natural hatchery and then speed, or you can do speed and then the natural. But it, his options kind of get getting taken away by Choi. The natural's still not up. He really needs to focus and get that natural hatchery up. I mean, if the run by gets blocked, he needs to be able to follow up here. Sloppy Probe Micro taking a lot of hits from the Zerglings. Now, oh, actually... It's not going to get cleaned up. Something with this build, you really have to get that probe taken care of before Zergling Speed gets done, and now it does, and uh, it looks like uh, Machine's going to have enough time to get down there when Zergling Speed finishes. If he does decide to run by, I mean, he only has six Zergling, so maybe he's not opting for a run by. Yeah, it seems like Machine is droning up here, which, I don't know, I think that's the wiser option. I mean, he's going to take his third now, so... Three hatches, three bases, that's that's always a good sign, or always necessary in Blue Storm anyway. And because of him overpooling, or nine pool I think it was actually, he's got uh, he's forced Choya into building the, the two cannons already, so that's slowed him down a little bit. But still, if you, if the Protoss has got his expansion up before you, you know, you're in a you you want to be looking to do some kind of damage. And we can see that the probe has returned back and has finally been killed off. Yeah, so given that he's not run by and he stuck with speed, I, I'd expect to see some sort of three hatch uh, layer into Spire build, which is really strong if you can execute it properly. You get those, uh, you get the scourge out at the same timing as Protoss gets his Corsairs if he is indeed opting some sort of Bisu opening, and uh, it really lets you take map control specifically on Blue Storm. So if that is what Machine is going for, it's a really nice opening. But his natural hatchery was delayed so much. And uh, if he did indeed go 9 pool, which I think you're right, it was 9 pool speed, not over pool speed, that does hurt your economy quite a bit. Uh, so, I mean, taking it to a later game may not be something Machine really should be looking to do at this point. Yeah, well, it seems like he will be going for the Lair Spire option as he's halfway through his Lair now and is patrolling frantically with the Zerglings trying to find any kind of proxy, any kind of fast expand, any kind of probe scout. So he's doing all he can with those six lings. And you're not too much going on. Choya has uh, has got a pretty tight wall there. He's got the Gateway Forge and the Cybernetics Core 
all there nicely defending him out, and he's got a nice little choke point there to defend him with his probe and Zolot, so he's very well safe from any kind of run buys. And we can see now in his main, he's already started his Stargate, so pretty much standard things from both sides, oh, all after the initial 9 pull anyway. Yeah, something the 9 yes, pull speed, sorry, uh, forced, is that typically you can make that Stargate a little earlier, you don't have to wait for the second Zealot. But uh, Choya clearly worried about some sort of all-in Zergling, waiting for that Zealot before he puts down the Stargate. So that's going to work to Machine's favor with the Spire building now. Uh, he, he may be able to save all his, Zerg all his overlords uh, if Choya decides to scout the main instead of targeting the overlords. And uh, Machine now retreating his overlords, still on three hatcheries. I would have liked to see a fourth hatchery a lot faster here. You can normally uh, just cut some drones, get a fourth hatchery. Unless Machine is deciding to go for the Mutalisk, uh, option, which it doesn't look like. He's not building too many overlords and he's not saving Larva, so it's not going to be that. He's just opening Scourge at this point. Yeah, but with that said, I mean, he was rather delayed from his failed 9 pool, which really didn't be able to do anything. That did hurt his economy a bit, so I th I'd expect his timing to be a little slower than you'd expect normally. That's true. Up to 400 minerals now. He needs that fourth hatchery. What is he doing? I think he's actually going to go for the Mutalisk. I mean, he's up to 600, 600 now. I mean, this is this this isn't going to end well. Choya's adding cannons everywhere, so I think he's really getting prepared for the old Mutalisk harass here in the first Sierra Zone now. So this is not looking good for Machine, especially in the laggy conditions, which is something that's often forgotten about when you're viewing a replay. Yeah, for sure. And if the timing of this is proper, you can get out. Uh, about seven Mutalis and two Scourge, and then make more Mutalis right following that. And Machine is really delayed, I don't think he has that coming. Now taking a fourth base, which will be nice, but the Bisu build, which is what uh, Choi is doing, is going to really shut that down. Uh, Machine not, not moving any Overlords to bottom right, and doesn't have Overlord speed coming, so... I mean, the first Dark Templar is clearly going to go bottom right, shut that down. Uh, not a good idea for Machine there. Now the Mutas are out, he's going to have to see what he can get done, but... I mean, look at these cannons, look at the placement, and uh, only one Corsair, so I mean, if he does continually make mutas, there's a chance, but I mean, I, I really think the advantage is in Choi's favor thus far. No, oh, definitely, I mean, here comes the mutalist harass now, and those, those cannons are really doing a good job of stopping down those, stopping those mutalists. I mean, the mutalists have decided to take out the front of the cannons, but then the second one warps in and everything's screwed up. And we've seen now the, the Seer coming in and trying to do some get some splash damage and, and the Scourge trying to snipe it. Oh, and the Scourge managed to snipe it. And Machoya is now adding another cannon to just defend a cough up off the harass. And he's adding two more cannons in his main. So, I mean, he's he's getting prepared for any kind of mutualist goal in. So, I think I think what Machine is doing is right by taking that fourth base now. But he really does need to get some kind of detection down there. But we see the first Dark Temple is actually going into the mineral only. He's getting one, two kills before the Sun Cannon is up. Three kills before Machine actually realizes it. And so that is not what Machine needed at this point. At least he managed to kill the Dark Templar. Oh, and the Dark Templar is actually harassing the fourth base now and manages to actually stop that expansion. So Machine is not not in a very good position right now. He is really behind. Yeah, he actually did well to defend that. A weaker player would have left his Mutalist at the natural, seeing there's only one cannon, tried to kill all the probes, and then lost quite a few of drones uh, to the Dark Templar. It was nice of him to bring that back, try to defend that. He switched over to Hydras now, but still on three hatches. He needs that fourth hatch somewhere. Be it in his main or his third base. I mean, he can't he can't just keep sitting like this on three bases, looking to eventually take bottom right. It's going to be too late. He's not going to have the production he needs. Dark Templar coming in now. It's got eight kills. Wow, nine kills. And those are largely drones, I'd imagine. So nine drones lost. Uh, wow, that's not what Machine needed doing this hungry build. Yeah, so far what we've seen from the Koreans is really, really good harass. I mean, one thing that is slightly working in Machine's favor is that the Mutalisks have forced Choya to make a few Archons, which don't do that well against Hydralisks, but I mean, that's really nothing to complain about. Choya's in a very, very commanding position. And I don't believe uh, Machine's actually decided to follow up with Hydralisks. It looks like he's researching Lurkers. I don't know if he has any upgrades. It looks like he's got speed on those Hydras, but I can't imagine he has range on it. So I don't think it's going to be a pure Hydra follow-up, which would have been nicer against the Archons. Uh, Lurker's not going to be as effective. And, I mean, Choya being the, the pro gamer or expert gamer. Oh, Mute is coming in. Wow, going to get sucked in the Archons. Terrible. All the Mute is dying except two. Not what Machine needed. And now Choya has no reason to stay at home. He's just going to roll yeah. out. Machine is in a lot of trouble here. 
I mean, Choi is now trying to take his third while Machine is struggling to get his fourth up. I mean, this is not the position Machine really wants to see himself in. I mean, now we've got this whole bunch of speed zealots and an Archon going down to the fourth base. So, although Machine's got the Overlord there now, it's not going to make any difference against those five, six zealots. Although he is preparing to move in with some Hydra, so he may just be able to save it. But, who knows? And the timing of Machine all game. Sorry, it's just been Machine's a little reaction slow. Is actually kind of slow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's slow there. I mean, he's going to lose that hatchery. Yeah, and there it goes, right there. Wow, I no, mean, Machine could have possibly said that if he reacted immediately. But, Choi is going to get away without losing a single unit for stalling Machine's fourth even further. And meanwhile, Choi has basically got his third up, so this game is, is rapidly approaching its end, I'd imagine. And Machine was actually at 900 minerals, still at 3 hatcheries. I mean, at some point, you've got to cut your losses and put that 4th hatchery down. It, it, this problem is just going to compound. Machine's not going to have enough units, not going to have enough drones. While well, he's struggling to get that 4th base up. And look at uh, Choya, just has 90 supply at this point. Machine at 66, really not boating well. He's finally got Lurker tech up. But only enough gas to make... Uh, actually, there's quite a few Lurkers. He's got uh, 9 Lurkers coming. But if he can't do something with these, like, right now... The game is just going to slip away from him. He can't go into split map mode this far behind with uh, with a Protoss at the pro gamer level, especially. What Machine is probably going to do here, as we're seeing, is we're seeing Machine trying to go in and take out that third. Now that's well, well, that's what he needs to do. But what what's wrong here is we got Troya coming in with that force he was stalling at six, which killed the last hatchery. That's going to kill the fourth. And that's going to put Machine even further behind. And so if he really can't do serious damage with this attack, then he's really behind. So here we come the Lurkers in the burrowing now. But he's got a lot of cannons here and observers, so I don't think they're going to be too, able to do much damage at all here. Amazing nice storm by Troya, absolutely great. Incredible storms, my god. And now the Zealot's going to come in. Everything is weakened under there, and that's just going to get cleaned up. And that is going to be that. That was absolutely disastrous. That was amazing storming by Troya, but I mean, that was kind of helped by the fact that Machine was trying to rush in and his units were rather clumped. I mean, those units that just took out Machine's fourth are coming up and trying to take out the third now. I mean, they have a very good chance of doing that, because there's not exactly a lot of units that Machine has left, because he's only on three hatcheries still. It seems like a theme thus far is like ill preparation by Team Liquid. I mean, JF's build looked wrong, Machine's build also looked wrong, and and Teskey played the wrong race. So, I, I mean, it is very unnerving to play a pro gamer, I'll give you that. When I played Sea Shield, I pretty much wanted to cry. I was so nervous. So, that clearly plays a factor. It's unfortunate that we can't see their best game uh, when they get, get in a match like this. Yeah, I mean, I know um, Cloud was a, is still a little, at this stage, was still a little unknown about what he was going to play. Um, I know Infernal has practiced really hard for this, so I'm um, interested to see how his game goes. And I think the 3v3 team has had a bit of practice, so there's still some hope left. I mean, we see Troy are now taking his fourth base, so this game is well and truly over, because Machine still hasn't been able to get up that fourth. But I mean, one thing that has impressed me thus far is, is the fact how the Koreans are able to exploit every little fault that the foreigners have got. I mean, before we saw JF with his faults against the the vultures. I mean, that was game changing. That was the defining moment of the game. And here we have Troya being able to continually shut down that fourth with Dark Templar, with Zealots, and whatever. And we've got four more Zealots going now to take out that expansion. I mean, it's it's really in a way depressing, but in a way amazing at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> is there a fourth hatchery yet? No. My God. No. And Machine is still on three hatchery. <laughs> Look at the macro from Protoss. I mean, his minerals typically under a thousand. Look at all these gateways: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight gateways and four bases, and warping in top left. Wow. He's actually got double the supply of machine right now, so he should be feeling very confident right now. I'm surprised that none of the Koreans have actually gone out and done something crazy like trying to mind control us or something like that. Other than Choi's mass nexus, of course. Yeah, I, I feel if this was more of a grudge match, there may be some sort of bad mannerism, but right now it looks like they're just trying to play standard, show how well they can play. Uh, I guess, well, I guess building seven nexuses is pretty borderline bad manner, but looking at the upgrades too, Machine's still at zero zero, whereas Troya is at one armor, two attack, so 
that also does not help his cause. Yeah, and we can see Zealot's going again to the fourth. I mean, Machine just can't get up that fourth at all, no matter what he tries. He really needs to cut his losses and, like, put some workers there. I mean, he's got plenty up there at the front line doing basically nothing. And he still can't get up that fourth because he just can't defend it. Now he's trying to go into a uh, split map mode, but you really have to be closer in supplies for this to work. There's Look at the sick army from Trev, largely Dragoons. Just going to come in, storm the lurkers, Dragoons will clean up, and I mean, he just needs to punch a little hole in that wall at any point, and then he can flank around. Looks like he's going to do it at the south, which is the weaker end, driving through. Uh, he actually gets turned away, but I mean, I, I can't imagine that's going to hold him back for too long. He's going to build up, and then, oh, what is this Nexus wall? <laughs> at 12 o'clock, nice. <laughs> Here we go, here's, your, here's what we expected to see. So we've got three Nexus as well being for Troyer, so he can really be called the Nexus toss. Wow, he's building a wall of Nexuses. This is ridiculous. Oh, he's up to six Nexuses now. <laughs> what the hell is going on here? This is what, how you tell someone in StarCraft, you are very bad, I am very much better than you, when you just start building random Nexuses in the middle of the map. Oh, I'm surprised he hasn't started writing anything yet. A bit of a, maybe, GG or <laughs> something in Korean that we won't understand. Hey, speak for yourself. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> That's right, you're bottom right now. got shut down again. Yeah, but Machine's trying to finally decide not to take the bottom right, and he's taking 6 o'clock, so... At least there's no zealots harassing that yet. <laughs> Look at Protoss' macro. Wow, his minerals at 300. I guess when you're building all nexuses, it's pretty easy to macro, but it's still impressive. Yeah, I mean, he's got... Ooh... About 3,200 minerals worth of nexuses in that nexus war. <laughs> pretty easy to sink your minerals into something like that. Oh, and here we go. The zealots are coming into 6 o'clock, and... Machine actually might defend it this time, although the lack of upgrades is really hurting him because those zeal uh, those links can't actually hurt those zealots at all. Oh no, here comes a lot more units, and that expansion will live to live another day. Meanwhile, Troy is still building nexuses. <laughs> Next I'm not even cannons, focusing on the uh, game, I'm just watching the nexuses. Like, what will he do next? Oh, this is... Exactly what we expected to see once they had an advantage, really. And Choya's coming in and pushing through this lurker wall fairly well. Machine isn't able to snipe the observers effectively, and this should be game about now. There's nothing Machine can do. This fourth was way, way, way too late. Yeah, so he's just gonna get steamrolled. We look at the supplies 182 to 68, and that's <laughs> gonna be it. Wow. We're up to like nine, ten nexuses now, <laughs> and there we go. Machine taps <laughs> out. Eleven nexuses. It's got to be some sort of record. I don't know. Across those two games, he's probably built about fifteen, seventeen nexuses. <laughs> That's so great. All right, maybe we'll have a closer match now. We've got Cloud up next against Terra on Andromeda, which. I don't know, I like Protoss vs Zerg on it, but the stats say otherwise. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as a Zerg, you've got to be confident on Andromeda playing against a Protoss. Especially, I think there's sort of a... It, it tails off as you get closer to pro gamer level. I mean, when you can do fancy reverse air builds, it, it becomes a little more balanced. But at the foreigner level, it's just, you know, foreigners can't pull off the kind of micro you need to open up reverse air on Andromeda, so they open up with some other build which is just unbelievably weak, and it's really easy for Zergs to, to just steamroll over for us on this map. So I, I really think Cloud is up against it. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right there. I mean, Reavis here is the optimal build here, and so foreigners usually can't pull it off as well as the programmer, so he's going to suffer. So we'll expect Cloud to fast expand, though, I mean, but he'll probably play a more ground-based approach, whereas Terra will likely go three base and some usual lists because he just loves them that much. Alright, so we've got Cloud in the top right playing Protoss as uh, red, and we've got uh, 1A, 2A, 3A uh, at the bottom left as purple Zerg. Surprisingly Zerg with that name. You would think he was a Protoss. 
Yeah, well, some of these Zergs got really crazy names, like uh, Kwanro changed his name to 4 High Tech, whatever the hell that means, and we got Terra changing his name to 182A3. I mean, what's up with these people? 4 High Tech? Really? Yeah. I is that Korean or English? It's it's in English, but I have no idea what it means. I mean, I guess it means that Kwanro wants to tick up and build high tech units, but they're just they're just not him. I mean, oh, I suppose he's done the two base ultra before, so it's kind of valid. Kwanro's base, Kwanro's name should be like game over within seven minutes tops. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think he's only won two games that's ever gone longer than seven minutes. <laughs> and here we've got. Cloud putting his pylon at his natural as expected and scouting towards the bottom right. So, I mean, cross positions, that's got to work in Cloud's favour, marginally. But, we'll definitely see what happens. I mean, as as a Zerg player against Protoss, I mean, you can do a lot of cheesy stuff, which can be really annoying. And Terra could pull off something like that. I mean, it's, it's within his style. I mean, he loves the whole micro aspect of things. So we've got uh, an overpool from Terra. I find that kind of surprising, given that when I was practicing this map, I tried every cheese Protoss against Zerg, and none, none of them work against a 12 hatch. So I would think a 12 hatch is a better build. Um, I don't even know what he could be expecting to play kind of a safe overpool style, and he's not getting gas, so it's not going to be a run by. But it, it worked out in his favor as Cloud is forced to put that forge down first, now realizing that uh, overpool is coming, so he can cannon up and then get that nexus. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, modern Zergs are tending to play the pool first against Protoss, which is kind of understandable, I mean, it does put the Protoss behind a bit, but Andromeda is a, a map where macro really is everything, so if everything goes according to plan, I expect Cloud to come up with at least a marginal advantage here. Cloud being very cute at the natural, he was harassing that drone, the drone went to build an extractor to get its HP back, and Cloud actually built the uh, assimilator first. Uh, stopping the drone from doing that, and then decided to stop paying attention and just let the drone build a hatchery anyway. So I don't know what's up with that. Uh, Cloud saving up 400 minerals and then putting down two cannons. What are foreigners doing today? What? Why? Why? My guess is that he didn't see the. My guess is that he saw the gas that it wasn't taken, so he expected it just to be nine pool with drones. But when, once he saw the legs, he was forced to build those cannons first. I mean, they'll come in time, but still, it's kind of iffy. Yeah, I guess no harm, no foul, because he didn't need the cannons, but it just seems, you know, really strange to to do it like that. It's, yeah, it's exactly. kind of giving shaky got... confidence in foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, now we've got the third hatch from Terra going in as mineral only, as expected, and the gas finally going up, so nothing too interesting going on. Pretty much what we expect, and the Nexus is now going down for Cloud, so all's well so far for Cloud. Yeah, and this 3-hatch gas, if he decides to go into Lair, is a really, really, really strong build on Andromeda. If you open up Spire, as we saw uh, Machine do on Bluestorm, those are the two maps. Uh, that 3-hatch Spire is incredibly strong on is uh, Andromeda and Bluestorm. Yeah, surprising, because uh, those are the two maps that Machine requested. Obviously, he preferred Bluestorm first, but Andromeda was the, his close second. We'll have to see if this is some sort of Hydralisk uh, follow-up, or if he's going to play safe or tech to lair. Gas coming in, he's got 100 now. Let's see what he decides to spend on Zergling speed. Really? Zergling speed? Interesting choice there. But I mean, the probe still is in the main, so I suppose he'd rather get something which you can't see first. Although I suppose it's kind of obvious when you think about it. If you've got gas running, you're not getting a lair. Oh well. A bit of background on this this game. Cloud specifically requested to play Terra after we found out he was playing, so the man's got balls, we'll give him that. And let's check these eggs. Zergling, 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 oh, no. Zergling. I am not feeling good for Cloud as he's not even three attempting hatch. to scout. This is gonna be a three hatch ling, I would I would imagine. And with two cannons, that's gonna be a mission to stop. Typically, yeah, you see sure. Protoss make that third cannon to stop off the three hatch. I mean, that's what all well, Best and Bisu have done recently, as far as I can remember. So, two cannons is really going to struggle against, you know, three hatches producing full wings. And I really think this isn't something Terror came in expecting to do, but that placement is really bad. This, this wall, 
this uh, gateway forge cannon block is just terrible. There's no other way to put it. And I think once he saw that, he was like, all right, I can just, you know, attack, move through this. And here we go, Zergling. Here we go. Here comes the link. Bye. Zergling's just running and in, surrounding the cans. Oh. That's gonna be it. That's game. Cloud, what are you doing, man? Learn how to make that a proper wall. Very this disappointing. Is oh, there we go. Those links are running rampant through that natural, and they're taking out probes, cannons, whatever. That's from someone who specifically requested one of the greatest microwiz in the B teamers. This is very depressing. Like again with my theme of ill preparation. Like you didn't learn how to wall in properly on Andromeda. Seriously. I'm I'm not surprised really. Cloud didn't know what build he was going to use coming into this game. So epic how face palm really. How can you how can you do that? How do you I not put no me idea. in this match? Look at these results. I could give these results. Yeah, of course you could, so you just lose to anyone that played anyway, so... I don't know, maybe you no, could fight for sure. the Terran. At least I could make it, like, a little nicer than this, like, a little funner. <laughs> there we go, there's the GG. So, okay, up next is Infernal, and hopefully this game will be better. Uh, my, uh, Firefox crashed, so do you wanna give us a little heads up on what this match is? Yeah, it should be Infernal versus, uh... Uh, it should be Inversal versus Clyde, but Clyde had to switch out at the last moment, so instead we get Miracle. For those of you who aren't familiar with Miracle, he is one of the best D teamers I've ever seen play. During the Phobos SG show match for um, the Barbara Star League, Barbara Clan League, actually, um, Miracle was sent out against Pusan, who was on a 3-0 uh, three, three, streak, I think. Then managed to defeat Pusan, managed to defeat the Zerg, and then managed to defeat Oversky, I believe. All in a row before he was stopped. So, this guy knows what he's doing. He is very, very good at what he does. Still there, Jill? Yeah, yeah, of course. A bit quiet there. Oh, well, okay. Well, what we do know about this is that Infernal has practiced. He's been practiced this quite a bit. Um, I was talking to her, one of his training partners, Naruto, beforehand. You may know him from Team Liquid, about how hard they practice this match, and apparently they were playing all night, one build. So we should see what this is. I'm pretty sure that Infernal may may just be able to come out with a with a fairly decent mid game providing he doesn't let anything stupid happen. Yeah, and for anyone who's watched recent uh, PVTs on Destination, it's got two ramps that makes it kind of similar to uh, Nostalgia, if you're f familiar with that old school map, and this makes it really easy to expand. So we've actually seen Protosses opening quite often with uh, 12 Nexus, and Terrans opening with 14 Command Centers. And when they don't do that, they typically do builds designed specifically to crush the other person fast expanding like that. So, I mean, two gate or some sort of two racks. So it's interesting to see, and typically Protoss has the advantage in this match. So I don't think we'd expect to see Miracle opening up with some sort of 12 Nexus bash. He's probably just going to open up safe. So I think, think Infernal should really open up 12 Nexus, and I'm going to be disappointed if he doesn't do that. I'm sure it'll be some variation on that, if nothing else. He may decide to place his gateway first just for safety, then take the Nexus. But, you know, 12 Nexus or some variation is definitely the better build to go. I believe Miracle was playing Pusan on this map, so his TVP here is, is really quite top notch. So we see a pro coming over making a gateway. Man, wh why would you play safe against a pro gamer? I don't understand the mentality in that. I can understand not cheesing him, but t I mean, you gotta take a risk in the early game to, to get some sort of advantage to carry you through into the late game against a pro gamer. This is just just bad coaching, really. Plexa, what are you doing? Yeah, I didn't coach this guy. The, his German team did, so whatever. So Infernal does play for MTW, so I don't know, maybe you should blame them. But they seem to be good guys all around, so I don't expect I do that. Blame well, here we go, here we go. Ah, oh, no, I thought that was going to build the Nexus. How disappointing. Anyway, Infernal's added his gas, so it looks like he's playing semi-standard at least. Although he has queued up an abnormal number of probes. So I don't know if that's a good sign or not. So, so Infernal's adding the core, so it looks like reasonably safe. And 
Uh, interesting, Miracle's opted to do the little supply trick as well to finish his wall off, but <coughs> regardless, Infernal was never going to be able to get in time to scout into his base anyway with that wall there. And yeah. Miracle is just about to add his factory, I believe. Maybe this yeah, uh, goes. depot trick is you know a standard maneuver against a weaker player, get it shut off, and then and then move in. Like, cause you never see that in actual pro gaming. You only, but you've seen it quite often in this match. It must be for safety. And we've got one SCB be, I mean, on gas, so fast expansion coming from uh, Miracle. I mean, I don't know if you noticed before, but Miracle did a little lap of his base on the SCV just to scout for any kind of proxy, so I mean, he's definitely playing safe and expecting some kind of cheese for Infernal, but he does, Infernal has got his expansion started now and is building his first Dragoon, so at least it's a semi-risky build, but still safe if he managed to do some kind of 2 racks build or something. Yeah, for sure, I'll give you that. Now he's uh, decided to cut probes, it's kind of strange to me. He's cut up to make his second gateway. Now our probe's gonna come back, I hope. Looks like no, gonna save up for a Dragoon. I, yeah, I think I he'll save up for range probes. first. Same job for range. Oh no, that's gonna be a Dragoon. No okay, range. There it goes. And in response, it looks like uh, Miracle's gonna lay his uh, machine shop out as expected, making a few more Marines. He's got four, uh, or two more queued up to make the total four. No command center yet, but he's actually mining gas again, so he may have scouted this and decided to try some sort of break here. Uh, yeah, he spent all his minerals, so not saving for a command center at this point. So he's going to try to end it very early, which is strange. You don't see Terrans open up like this and then decide to switch their game plan, which is what I believe has happened in this game. Yeah, he's just going to be able to do more or less a standard FD rush, which is nothing more than what Infernal should have practiced against. So Infernal should be ready for something like this if he's practiced as much as he said he has. So here we go, we got, got two the... more Dragoons coming from Infernal. And Infernal's trying to gain any more information about what's going on. Oh, and Miracle's finally moving out, building his Vulture from the factory while moving out with Marines. Pretty much what you'd expect from this. I was just going to add that everything is in Infernal's favor. He's cut probes to have a larger army at this point. This map is unbelievably easy to defend as Terran tries to cross those two ramps, so he really, really should be able to defend this. I mean, he's playing against a pro gamer, I'll give you that, but uh, with, with proper micro, and if he doesn't overreact, he should be able to do well here. Now coming in, uh, decides to try the SCV for a while, I don't know what was up with that. All the Marines getting taken out, and uh, Miracle gets turned away pretty easily. Now the Vulture coming in, laying a mine, that gets targeted easily. Second mine coming up, gets targeted. Uh, Vulture getting targeted now. Infernal doing really well, he didn't even need the bridge. Uh, the tank is dealing a lot of damage, but no, no support units left at this point. Oh. And uh, Miracle gets turned away fairly easily. Big mistake from Miracle, he's overextended himself with that tank. That tank is going to die, but will that mine get it? No, just, just. Right now, Infernal has, for the first time in this entire series, taken an advantage over a pro gamer. I think we've got a game in our hands. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he should just play safe, expand again, and look to compound his advantage, really. Or, I mean, alternatively, he could uh, play sneaky now that he's got map control, look to do some sort of timing all in uh, to try to end it both. Both very smart and viable options. I'd like to see him do one or the other, not kind of play in the middle as we've seen uh, foreigners do thus far. And with this probe moving to top left, I think we're going to see another base, which is uh, really nice. And uh, I really hope this pays off for him. The only thing he's going to be careful of is um, a little spot on the cliff where tanks can pound at any kind of wall that he's got there. And the vultures are going to come in and see this expansion. So Miracle does know what's going on. And in Miracle's base, we see that he's adding an extra two factories, so he may be looking out, looking to push, push out early against Infernal while he's still relatively low on unit count. Infernal doing really well with map control. He's got two Dragoons on the ramp at top left. He spotted the Vultures coming in, sending in a Zealot to draw the mine. Uh, he's going to draw the second mine, actually, so clearing that out. And he's got Dragoons at uh, top right, just blocking his natural, keeping it safe. I'm really impressed thus far. With Infernal's uh, decision making and his uh, his just his unit placement, it's it's really strong thus far. Yeah, I mean Miracle's only just got his first expansion online, which you know is definitely working in the favor of Infernal. I mean Infernal's got the economic advantage, he's got the map advantage, he's got the unit advantage, 
everything's working in his favour, which is finally good to see. We're just going to watch out for some kind of timing push, because here comes Miracle's two tanks down below, out just coming out of the ramps. So, I think they're going to go for that sweet spot and try hammer at that, that wall and use that, that annoying little ramp there, at, out just outside of Infernal's third, to s prevent Infernal from coming up, breaking it, and then basically s sealing the game off from Miracle. And so here we go. We've got him up on the cliff, he's laying the mines as expected, not doing anything fancy yet. Here comes the siege. Oh, will he get those probes? Oh, he only gets one, so that's relatively good. Okay, so now we've got an interesting situation. Fernal's really got to somehow get up there and break it. And if you look back in his main, he's got that sh a shuttle out. Don't know if that's got Reaver in it. No, it doesn't have a Reaver. The Reaver is still building. So Infernal, slightly bad here. He's got to defend this. If he defends it, very good position. Yeah, I've, I've got to wonder if the Reaver was timed to stop something like this, but just a little late. Sending in the uh, the shuttle, that's going to force the tanks on siege. Now the Vulture's sneaking right in. Oh, very bad. And... Uh, they're going to kill a ton of probes here, actually. Two probes, three probes, four probes... So, I mean, it could have been worse. He defended that pretty well, but... These this little things... Vulture's that coming up in the natural now. Oh, my God. Oh, no. We've seen another case of bad Vulture harass dealing with. And so the Reaver is now out, so now... Oh, no. Miracle's seen the Reaver, and he knows what's up there. And now he's trying to get a few more probe kills in the main. This is turning bad pretty quickly for Infernal right here. Yeah, the Reaver coming back trying to clean that up. The Vulture Micro is just ridiculous. Rage, you can take less than this, uh, this Vulture Micro, not taking any hits and dodging that Reaver. He actually dodged the Scarab. None of the probes are mining at the natural for Infernal. God, and tanks being rallied up to the third now. Gonna hammer on that wall again, and Infernal, wow, the walls are just crumbling down as quickly as they were built. He's got control of his main again, and he's mining again at his natural, finally. But he's lost control of that third base, and he's in a lot of trouble here. I cannot believe what I'm seeing here. Miracle's micro is is amazing. And to top that off, at the moment he has more units than Infernal does, even though he had the later expansions and so on. This is shocking play. Oh, the Reaver game managed to get the two kills. That's good play. I mean, Infernal's got a good chance of breaking this. If those, oh, he managed to target those vultures, and he's not going to be able to break this push. And I think that could be enough to seal the game off. Oh, vultures coming into the natural. This is really, really bad. The goon should be able to stop it though. Those Dragoons should have been able to stop that much better than that, though. He still took a lot of damage from Mines, and he's lost control of his third. This game, sadly, has gone sour really, really fast. But against something like Miracle, you really had to expect it. Oh no, those Maynarding probes out of that base are just getting destroyed by the tanks on the Lynch and the Vultures. He's lost too many probes. I mean, this game is quickly... is basically over. Yeah, and I mean how quick of the tides turned, it looked like uh, Infernal had a, a fairly substantial advantage going into the mid game, and that just got taken away so fast. Uh, Infernal did make a big mistake when he dropped that Reaver, he targeted the siege tanks. Had he targeted the unsieged tanks, it would have splashed, killed a lot of the vultures. That would have helped his cause trying to move in, and now these vultures moving to the natural yet again. Gonna clean this up, probes running, they're just gonna get sniped. Probes actually not running, they're deciding to fight. Uh, that might not be the best idea, and this is gonna be the end of the game, as all those probes essentially going down to just simple vulture harass. And really unfortunate uh, to see this kind of play again. This is just a testament to how good Miracle is. I mean, his micro with his vultures has been absolutely superior in every way to anything Infernal's been able to do. Bar his first push, which was really kind of crap, everything else has been absolutely amazing from Miracle. From his macro, I mean, right now he's sitting at 80 supply to Infernal's 40. I mean, that's impressive, considering how late his expansion was. And his vulture micro is, is simply phenomenal. In Infernal was just outplayed despite going, in, going into the mid-game with a big advantage. Yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> Infernal actually, I can give him credit that he planned a strong build and he played it well. You know, no discredit to him. He seems to be the most prepared thus far and GGing there. But, uh, you know, as you keep saying, just taken away, uh, the game was taken away by superior play. I think that's, I think that's the first time this has happened or, or, or the show match, really. The other games have been decided by, you know, stupid play by our side, basically. That was the first time we've actually played smart and managed to come out with an advantage because of it. But obviously that was the one game which has really showcased the 
the skill discrepancy between the foreigners and the B teamers. All right. So what are we down? Four nothing. <laughs> uh, five nothing now. Five, yeah, nothing? five nothing. Oh my god. So what happened right now is that the three v three was having a bit of trouble with lag issues. So we had to put that off until the final game while the guys fought over and killed each other over stuff about lag. So instead, for you right now, we've got Artosis up against. Ooh, I think they switched the players actually. They changed from Rani to Honjun, I think. Wa he's a B teamer on the Samsung Khan team, so he's got the old stalk experience and whatnot. And so he's he's more active than Rani was anyway. So not looking good for Artosis really. Alright. This is the map that Artosis specifically requested, so maybe he's got something planned. So we've, here we've got Artosis spawning in the left corner in a nice shade of yellow. Well we have Mystery Gamer in red in the bottom right. And it is indeed Honjun. So Honjun in bottom right, Artosis bottom left. Artosa splitting to the closest minerals, that's nice to see. Oh god, just sending another one to the bottom left. I don't know if that's the closest one, but it's nice to see him change. He used to split to like the bottom two and the top two, and it drove me insane every time I watched him. I know that's one of your pet peeves when people split to not the optimal mineral patches. Yeah, I mean, at this level, it's such a basic thing. It should, it should just become automatic. It takes you two seconds to figure out which are the fastest ones at each position, and that's something that can really affect your game. I mean, we saw it with, uh, with uh, not Legionnaire, Draco in the TSL. He would get ahead like, in every Protoss mirror matchup just because he split to the closest minerals and put them, uh, put his gateways at the proper time. It's such a basic thing that really drives me crazy. So we've got Artosis sending his first STV, going to be building a supply depot to wall in. And uh, Honju not scouting until after his gateway, which I suppose is standard, but against foreigners it wouldn't be surprising to see him scout a little earlier. Oh, uh, well to be fair, this is standard play for Protoss on this map. They always skate, uh, scout generally after the gateway. I just think that um, Artosis' time with uh, Istro and IEG has kind of rubbed off on him. I mean, you've seen that he's started to split to the right patches. So, I'm hoping for a good game here. Hoping? Optimistic, but in reality, it should be shouldn't be that long before we see some advantage coming up for Honju, and I'd imagine. Yeah, and Artosis is really going to have a mental challenge here. I mean, he's playing Protoss God, a pro gamer Protoss. What Terran could be up against that? Yeah, well, we see Honju scouting after gas, and I think he's going to scout. Yeah, ooh, no, he's going to scout to the north, so he's not going to see what Artosis is doing, so Artosis should be able to wall off nicely. So, small little advantage there for Artosis. We'll take whatever we can get, right, Jill? Yeah, for sure. Hey, did you ever read Fake Steve's quote where um, in the TSL we made up fake profiles for everyone? Did you ever read Fake Steve's about Artosis? Don't think I did. It's, it's about, like, some, some woman comes into Artosis, uh, his office, and puts StarCraft on the desk, and the line is something like, Artosis had heard about StarCraft, the game where <laughs> useless Terran mortals, uh, I can't remember the exact line, it's like, just got beaten by advanced Protoss and Zerg over and over. It, it, everyone <laughs> should go to that thread, it's ridiculous. That's so appropriate, especially for this matchup. <laughs> Sure. Alright, we've got uh, three on gas. He's pulling one to build the factory. Keeping two on? Two on? So, Siege Expand, I believe, is indicative of that. Yeah, that's likely what he's going to be playing. I mean, he should ex be expecting Hondrun to be 14 Nexusing, but he hasn't, so. At least he's not going to come off too bad economically if he's going to go Siege Expand. A Zelda, wow, that's that's kind of unusual in Artosis with a full wall and marines, so that's really not going to be effective, but just a testament to how safe these uh, pro gamers are playing against foreigners. Yeah, one thing on Colosseum which uh, old Daikomi thought that would be a bad thing for Terran against Protoss here is that the wall is very, very vulnerable to Dragoons because they can stand up on the cliff right next to the barracks and take shots with the high ground advantage that can be quite devastating. And here we got the first Dragoon coming across the map, so he will look to pressure the wall a little bit at least. 
Yeah, for sure. And what with one gate siege, that just opens up his options to harassing that wall. He's got the dragoon coming around now. Let's see. Uh, if, wow, add on. Looks a little late. I don't know how it could be late. Artos seem to be playing uh, properly here, but the Dragoon pounding on the Marines, and now the Zealot going to work on the depot. Artos is in a lot of trouble here. That add-on is not even 50% done. He's scrambling to make Marines pulling SCVs, but the wall is just getting beat on. Now uh, let's check uh, Dragoon range. It's at about 66%. Uh, first Marine goes down, second one getting beat on, and this wall is still getting taken out. Artos have to be very, very, very careful here at this point. Okay, at the moment we've got Artosis and he's building a second factory. That's a good sign because we've got Honju not 14 Nexus to get pressuring. So I guess Artosis was expecting some kind of 14 Nexus to pressure. However, what we've got here is this, this pressure against the wall and that wall is looking very bad. I mean it's only down to less than half health now and there's no tank in sight. Those, those SCVs are going to struggle to get there on time and I think the wall just might go down here. Artosis is hardly trying to kill, stave off that goon with his marines. But oh, Artosis just manages to save his wall. That is very, very close. Too close really. But look at the amount of dragoons, dragoons coming, coming in, now. and now, now that they have this range, I good. mean, that tank is still vulnerable. If Artosis isn't very, very careful with it, it doesn't have siege, siege is not coming. Uh, that, that tank is just going to get sniped right away. Oh no. Okay, the, the add-on is building at the second factory, but I don't think it's going to be in time. We've got the wall being pressured really, really hard here, and we've got... Oh, those dragoons just may take out that tank. Oh, they take out the tank! This is, this is very, very not good. We've got one marine for Artosis. And we've got, oh my god, this is just devastating. I am actually surprised at how how easily uh, Atos has lost this game. I don't even have any words for this. This is just terrible. <laughs> what the hell is this? This is elementary PvT. I mean, you, you expect to be able to defend your wall. I mean, you know, I could have done that. It's not hard. <laughs> Alright, we're down 0 6, one game to go, and it's not looking good after after Testy and Insane getting completely destroyed on Hunters before. This is the one game I thought we could win was the 3v3, because I don't know if pro gamers practice 3v3. I've got to imagine they don't. No, but 3v3 is rather popular in the Korean scene. I mean, they are notorious for their all Protoss 3v3s, which are always fun to watch. But yeah, before this match, we had Testy coming around with more issues than we really wanted. I mean, he had the the mouse drivers screwing up on him because of the stupid virus. We had his computer having to restart multiple times. We had him having to update Chaos on the day. I mean, Testy really came into this unprepared, and my guess is that he's going to be the weak link here, even though we've got the newcomer, Tupac... What is his name? Tupacalypse. So, I don't know. I think, I mean, Tupac... Tupacalypse is like, he, he's known in the BGH community as one of the better players, so that works in our favour I guess, because no one really knows anything about him, except in Sade and TSD, so we should be fine. Alright, last game coming up here, hopefully better than the last few. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Man. What were we thinking doing community against community? We should, clearly should have done staff against staff. Yeah, staff against staff, we would have destroyed them because they're, they're not that great. It's, but, dude, it's uh, better than this. Yeah, at least we have won. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so team, team Liquid's Pride and Glory is out here on the line. So, what we've got, we've got, I think, I believe it's Insane at the top left, two pack lips at 12, and Testy in the bottom right, in orange. Okay. There we go, Testy is in orange. So, and then we've got, for our good friends at Waigosu, we've got Terrafo playing Terran at, at the top right, which isn't the Terrafo from STX, the mutualist guy. We've got Modern Foe, the only programmer to ever lose the Toss Girl at the, at the left expansion. And at the bottom left, we've got Ianfo playing Protoss instead of Terran, as we expected before in the first game. Yeah, I mean, Triple Protoss is known to be the strongest matchup on, on at least BGH. I don't know, I've got to imagine it applies to Hunters as well, so I don't know why they're sending out this Rainbow team as opposed to all Protoss. Do you have any insight into that? I think it was a misunderstanding, personally, but 
don't know. I cleared with him that we could send the same race on uh, hunters on both uh, sets, and they yeah. they were okay with it. But I don't know if that message got through. If they could send different race, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, PTZ is still playable if there's, if one of the teams goes down early thanks to the, the Zerg nine pool. Yeah, well, we clearly need every advantage we can get. <laughs> Obviously, Modern lost to Tosca, so he's not exactly your best Zerg in the world. Looks like again the Zerg is going to be doing 9 pool speed. Terran with uh, one Rax thus far, we're going to have to see if he puts down a second Rax. I've got to imagine he will. Uh, SCV sending out, so two Rax from the Terran, and uh, every Protoss is going to 2 gate as expected. Yeah. I mean, pretty much. As you said, everything's expected so far. And we've got both Testy and Insane scouting out for the final player. I believe they know where the Zerg player is thanks to the Overlord. I believe they've already scouted the Terran and they're just looking for old Ian playing Protoss. Some Korean chatting, I have no idea what that says. Well, it's nice to see that Koreans do chat in 3v3s and not just spam all the way. So Zergling's out now, speed started. Uh, this isn't going to be as effective as in the other game because we don't have a Terran that needs to be bunkered. Uh, two gate should be able to stop nine pool speed fairly easily. And then when all the Zealots unite and focus on one target, that should be pretty effective. Of course, I'm talking at the foreigner level. I'm not exactly sure how this will play out at the pro gamer level. Well, I mean, what we've got is we've got t uh, Insane and Tupac over there defending with both their Zealots. So we've got two zealots instead of what you'd usually have is one, being able to defend off these six legs relatively easily. I mean, the good thing about this match is that they didn't play this with, along with the casters and whatnot, so there was much less lag in this game. So, really, they should be able to defend this qu quite easily. The Koreans didn't cast us? What? No, what happened was that we couldn't fit all the casters in because it's the 3v3 and we needed three or four slots and we can only have two. So they played it uh, separately and we just broadcasted the replay as we're doing right now. Okay, okay, okay. So Insane has started gas actually with no core, that's surprising, but I mean Insane knows best on BG on Hunters and BGH, whereas uh, Tupacalypse is, is on three gates and Testy on two gates, uh, no gas. So surprising to see different play from all of them. Ironically, we've got Tupac playing better than Testy right now. I mean, Testy's kind of behind, really, when you've got 3 gate and the other guy's got 2 gate. And Insane is doing pretty much what you expect. You expect if you've got 3 Protoss against a Rainbow Team, you want to have some guy having some tech for the Dragoons so you can null the effect of Marines later on. And you've got the Zealots to deal with the early game harass from the Zerg and the, Pro and the Terran. Oh, the Zerg and the Protoss. Because really what you expect is that you expect the Zerg to fade away later in the game because they won't be able to keep on an, up an economy. Whereas you expect the Terran to be able to build out, build up much more of a bigger force in the late game and be much more influential then. So really what we've got our guys doing is trying to control the game here while getting some tech up. Because really they can only have two guys out attacking in the early game and two guys at the end. So we should be fine. Look at this cute little wall, uh, Insane and Tupacalypse holding hands, forming the wall at the Zerg's natural, so that's going to shut him right in. Uh, Terran really useless until they get medics up, and that's happening right now. Uh, medics coming out for Terror, so he'll be able to move out and finally join the fight. Uh, but, I mean, Insane's tech should be able to be out at that point, range Dragoons, to help deal with that. Yeah, and while we're in a bit of a lull right now, just like to say that Stick around for a little bit after this game is finished so you guys can hear about what we've got up next weekend. It should be good and it's going to be exciting, that's for sure. Can you tell me? Don't you know? No. This is why you need to check the forum more, Chill. This is a perfect <laughs> example. Okay. So we've got Ian trying to break out with his massive zealots against uh, all our good friend Apocalypse, who's also got some zealots trying to contain the Zerg. So that's why he's having to retreat here. That's why he's behind the unit count. Oh no, we're, our unit's getting sandwiched here by uh, our Terran friend here. And oh no, those firebats are going to be destroying those zealots. And our, we're being forced back. Insane and Tupac are in big trouble now. We've got a lot of zealots left over from Eon. And we've still got a lot of firebats left for the Terran. So this is not good. 
Tusty doing well actually to cut off reinforcements. Uh, his zealots are largely useless, but he is forcing the Terran back. And looks like uh, Yun is going to use his, his units here to flank this uh, Tupacalypse insane wall with, uh, with the Zerglings of uh, Modern. And that's going to let him out. Finally, uh, he'll be in the game. He's saying 12 half A with a little squiggly over it. I don't know what that means. But uh, it looks like Testy is largely forced back. No real tech for him. He's forced to put up cannons to help defend against this inevitable uh, M and M and F push coming here. I think there's a bit of a miscommunication over there. I think, don't think Modern actually wanted that to happen just then because he didn't seem prepared to engage. Anyway, Testy's being forced away by this M and M and F push here. And oh no, they're going to go counter the main while while we've got Ian coming in with the Zealots trying to take out the Testy Zealots. I mean, they've kind of regained the central ground here, but Testy's gonna die. Those firebats are just gonna eat those probes. Oh, and there they go. Oh my god. I love splash damage with those probes. I love the sound they like make when they die. Unfortunately, I play Protoss, so that's not too good, I guess. Anyway, and Testy's going down. His cannon's destroyed. His gateways are dead. Testy can effectively be ruled out of this game. And what we've got now is we've got everyone going to counter the Terran which is probably the best thing we can do right now because they're going to become monstrous at the end, by the end of this. And I don't think the Terran's going to be able to get back and defend and take out Testy at the same time. So, maybe going for a one-for-one -one trade here, which I guess is what the best possible outcome we could hope for. But, oh no, that bunker gets up, but only three, three Marines get inside, which is probably as good as it could have happened for us. So our, our guys, our boys are going in there, doing their job, and I don't think the Terran will be able to defend this. And Terran's coming back with his force now, leaving Testy pretty much dead. But he's still got a number of probes, and he's warping in some cannons, so he should be safe from Modern's Zerglings coming in. And so yeah, while we've got the Terran being destroyed, Go Testy is showing some impressive defensive skills, if you guys are watching that right now. While the Terran's force going up to defend his main is getting getting pincered by, our, by Insane and Tupac, so that's good. Testy should be able to come out, out of this sort of alive while the Koreans do lose their Terran player, which is as good as we could possibly imagine. I thought Testy was going to be able to hold up those Zerglings, but some Zealots from uh, from Yun actually joined up and finished that up. So Testy is going to be effectively out of the game, but I mean, trading one of your Protoss players for a Terran player seems like a good trade off in my mind. And now, especially because they share a choke. Uh, Tupacalypse and Insane can unite their forces. We see three cannons coming up from uh, Insane, and now Insane looks to expand. So that's really nice. Yeah, that I mean, really this plays is as good as we could hope for. I mean, Testy is—he's still in this. He's got—he's got four probes. He's got Nexus going. He's building. He's going to rebuild. Whereas the Terran player is completely out of this. I mean, those dragoons are just going to kill off those SCVs. Going to kill off that command center and. Effectively, going to be a good game for him. Meanwhile, the Zerg is is struggling to catch up an economy, and why has he built a hydralisk then? He's building workers. Why would you build workers in a two v two? I like his drones mining gas. That's probably why he did it <laughs> because he can't get workers enough gas. Workers are possibly the worst units you could ever build in a two v two if you're not familiar with this, and that's because their splash damage actually hurts your opponent as well. So while we've got a mass of zealots on our side. They've also got a mess of zealots that they've got to be careful of. So, I don't know really what to say about this. This is very strange play. Yeah, and, and if we look at bottom left, at uh, Yun making quite a bit of defense there, trying to tech towards Templar, but everyone is is quite uh, ready for that with Insane with his three cannons, and now taking his natural. This really looks good for Team Liquid thus far. Terran player manages to save a few SCVs and he has 600 minerals, so we could see some sort of late game revival from Terran. Alexa, possibly not here. Uh, Testy making another cannon, and he's actually alive. I'm surprised because he's had so many units in his base trying to finish him off. Uh, a lurker now rushing. That's probably going so to finish him off. We've got Ian he trying won't be able to take to his him. the bottom right expansion. So he's trying to get back into this by improving his economy. While at the same time he's managed to get Dark Templar out. So they've got largely detection based units here. So they've got both 
Dark Templar and Lurkers. Meanwhile, Testy is hanging in there and he's managed to build up a Citadel, so I guess he's going to protect Dark Templar. And we've got, I think it's insane taking the natural of the shared natural between him and two Apocalypse. And so he's also looking to get make turn this into a longer game now. Oh, but here we go. The Dark Templar are attacking the units here. And that's bad for us because we've only got detection static detection at the moment. Well, I don't think either I oh, no. Insane has managed to get a robo up, so he should have observers to to be able to move out effect effectively and rather quickly. But I think we might see what they did in the first game and try build up a contain on this truck, which should be relatively effective seeing as we've got two of our players in there. Oh yeah, the pylon actually going down, so cannons gonna be able to follow him. Cannons and lurkers, that's really hard to break out of. And lurkers hitting the zealots, splashing their own templar, that's really cute. One of that te one of those dark templars is already almost dead, just from that splash damage. And just a testament to how good Insane is, compare him with the other Protoss players. Insane at 73 supply, Dupocalypse at 45, and Yin at 51, so just crazy how he gets so far ahead. Hi, chill. Hey, what's up? So now I just got disconnected from Vent back now. So I think we've got the Terran trying to rebuild at 6. Good old New Zealand internet. Gets you every time. Last night I was actually, uh, I didn't want, oh, you, you made it through the lag, what the hell? I thought you were a goner. Which should be rather fruitless, seeing how behind he is. Yay, more lag. Can you hear me, chill? Yeah, pretty much. I made it through the lag, that was impressive. Yeah, it's kind of strange, I do have best internet package New Zealand has to offer, which is still crap. So, meh. Gotta love Australasia. I don't even, is this live now, or is this your lagging comments? I can't even keep track. I think this is live. You think? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, well, there we go. I think it's live, because I just responded to you. Anyway. I don't know how effective this container is going to be because they do have a lot of units and mobile detection out. Yeah, the Dragoon's explosive damage is going to be able to take the Lurkers down pretty easily and then move on to the cannons. And actually, they're not even fooling around waiting for more units. Apocalypse and uh, Insane driving. Oh, big storm! That is going to hurt a lot. But they're actually driving. Insane has so many units. How does he do this? He's just driving through with so many Dragoons coming straight through uh, Yoon's little contain. That's going to shut that right down. And wow. This is exactly what we're talking about in Good game job, two. Boys. This is exactly what we're talking about in the second game. Insane's macro is, is unparalleled on this map. And I think we forced the Koreans into submission here. I mean, Eon's got his expansion up. He's got two expansions up, actually. And Modern is trying to is hardly building up Sunkins and whatnot at his, at his own expansion, but I would imagine Insane would be able to break this. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, Testy is still alive. Look at him. He's got 19 probes. Nothing to scoff at. He's got enough cannons to defend against these couple lurkers. And I'm surprised Team Liquid didn't decide to drive into nine and finish that off. They've instead decided to go for Ian. Uh, driving down and lurkers and a lot of high templar. High templar storming there. Looks like they want to kill. Make sure that the Terran is dead. Uh, Terran not responding by lifting off. He's just decided to take the punishment of uh, the zealots coming in. Yeah, the one thing that I'm really missing from the Zerg is where are your mutalists? You need your mutalists in your two v two. It's just so effective against, especially a three p team, because. Defending with pure zealots against mutalisk is, is pretty damn hard. Oh, look at this. Uh, Modern just realized his, he has his natural so he can kill a sunken. I don't know how it took him so long to realize that, but wow, his drones are finally free. 
<laughs> yeah, well, that's why he lost to Tosco, right? And he will never yeah. live that down. Oh, no. I mean, when you're the only living programmer to ever lose to Tosco, I mean, that, that's, that's saying something about how bad you are. Nevertheless, Tupacalypse is taking a natural, and Insane is expanding again. So that's that's good from us. We're basically seizing control of this map. I mean, I don't know if you've got Team Colors on, but there's a lot of Team Liquid all over the place. And I mean, if it goes to the late game, having Testy alive is just going to be huge. He's up to 31 supply, wow. So at some point, uh, Insane and Tupacalypse can go over there, kill those few lurkers, and, I mean, keep them alive. Oh. It's 3 on 2. Test these Dark Templars have just absolutely destroyed every single probe at Aeon Foe's bottom right expansion. I mean, not killing Testy must really be hurting them right now. Oh, wow, Together those Dark Templars have really 15 kills. And Testy is expanding to the natural of the bottom right, whatever you want to call that. This is impressive play by us, I must say. Yeah, looks like uh, Team YG is up against the corner here. I mean, the uh, Yun is their, their only really strong player left in the game, and he's completely contained. And uh, Modern really has nothing going for him. He's got a lurker sunk and contained. I don't know what his plan is. He's researching drop, so maybe some sort of slow drop, but he's got really nothing going here. We can see a Templar in Yun's, uh, or not Yun, in Modern's base with eight kills, so I guess that's just storming insane over and over and over. That's really annoying, but really nothing you can do in these positions. Exactly. I mean, I'm very impressed with how Ian's defending this. I mean, Insane's got a lot of units, and he's doing a real phenomenal job at keeping him out. Probably because he's got so many um, High Templar. But at the same time, they forfeited map control. Team Liquid looking to uh, to take three more bases, two of them online, and uh, Testy's coming up soon. I mean, once they add any sort of reavers or just enough gateways, you're looking to, to push out a little bit, getting a lot of storms here. Storming the Zealots, now moving in with four more High Templar. One storm completely misses. Wow, that was bad. So another storm everywhere. Storm on the Templars, and uh, Testy saying we won if we stay put, uh, sticking his tongue out, Definitely smiley face. Testy. Huge storm on the Dragoons there, but it's not really going to matter. It, the, the advantage here is, is too much. Exactly. I mean, our macro is just really killing them right now. And even though Ian is doing a brilliant job defending with those amazing storms, you can't do anything against five times your unit size. Yeah, for sure. It looks like they're going to drive straight through uh, into Ian's natural. There's quite a few uh, cannons up there, and he's reinforcing well, but but three players uh, worth of units driving in and High Templar being reinforced from, from Insane. It looks like this is going to spell the end for me. I don't know. I think Eon should be able to defend this. Even though there's a lot of units, I have a lot of faith in his defending abilities. At least it forced him to go back temporarily. I mean, here comes Modern with a lot of Zerglings. So, oh my god, how did he actually defend that? That was amazing. A lot of those Dragoons have gone down and here comes Zerglings and they should clean this up even if it is just because of self-storming. With that said, Testy's Dark Templars are proving to be really annoying, and Tupacalypse is now taking the center, and Insane has the top center base, so we've got a very, very strong economic economy right now. Finally a Spire up for Zerg, and speed and drop done, so this is what he's waited for all game. He's loading up uh, the Overlords in his main. Oh, uh, no he's not, he's just bringing them together, not actually loading them. I've really been waiting for this drop for a while, but it uh, looks like he's going to delay it. Oh, and there's been a, a bit of a lurker drop at the top right. A few lurkers, four kills on them, but not too much of a matter. They've only been delaying mining, not killed anything. Uh, Zerg's still not loading it for that Doom drop, I'm expecting. Yeah, but come on. I mean, Insane's already got such a monster economy. It's, not, it's only putting a marginal dent in his already vast empire. No, I mean, it's it's pretty much hopeless, but there's nothing else he can do. Looks like Yoon's trying to give no, a final uh, final push here, but the cannon's coming online, and Tupacalypse has enough reinforcements to turn him away before while Insane and Testy will link up in the middle. Now that they have middle control, I mean, if the game wasn't all but over before, it definitely is now. Yoon lost control of his choke, uh, unlike Eminem on D-Night, and uh, it looks like the three of them are just going to roll in to 6 o'clock and shut that down again. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, once you've got center control on hunters, I mean, that's pretty much game right there. I mean, Team Liquid actually has every single base on the map, except for 6 o'clock, Eon's base, and Modern's base. And I mean, 6 o'clock is basically shared with um, Eon's choke anyway, so Team Liquid have firmly, firmly taken a huge advantage and should win this. Yeah, a bit of a counter here from Modern on uh, 12 o'clock inside natural. Like it shut down from reinforcements from three places. And uh, yeah, I mean, Team Liquid just needs to, to secure their bases and focus one attack on one person, and that, that's just going to steamroll over them. I mean, Testy's got himself up to 72 supply, which is rather impressive seeing he's down to like, what, five pros before? Two Buckalops is still around 80, and Insane is monstering it out on 140 supply, which is insane considering modern is only on roughly 60 and eons on six uh, on 90 i mean insane has just dominated this game yeah insane is a beast you do not want to play this guy on hunters or pgh he's ridiculous which is why i think if we gave him a competent zerg wink wink on hunters he would have been a good 2v2 hey 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 i reckon if there was no lag that would have been fine Testy That's a way too well. lag. <laughs> he did. Uh, he did really well uh, to stay alive. There was a lot of situations there. I don't know if you saw, like lurkers hitting his nexus. He had to pull probes and like flank with them to kill the lurkers. In situations like that, he yeah. did really well. He was really up against the wall. I mean, the, as you said, they had lurkers basically harassing him for about 75 percent of this game. So he's done really well to bounce back from this. And his defense when modern and came in with those circlings was was really really good and props to Testy for that. He really pulled through finally. So here comes the the beefy, I mean you thought Protoss 1A, 2A, 3A was bad. Look at how about three times that. Just steamrolling through, cutting everything down. And uh, Team Liquid gonna get saved from uh, from getting pantsed here. Oh, finally comes the Zerg Doom Drop. Modern is finally doom dropping Insane's main, but at this stage, it's far, far too late. And Insane has a number of other bases, and he's starting to open gateways at top right, so this attack, while effective, just won't do enough. Yeah, I think this is like 10 minutes too late. Could have been nice to, uh, to pull, you know, a well-timed attack like this, could have been nice to pull Insane's attention back pull his army back, but at this point they've already forfeited too much map control, it's just not going to work. Looks like everyone's reuniting outside of, uh, of Yoon's choke, and now going to get ready to move in there and try to finish this game. This is exactly why our guys hit the Tyrion player as opposed to the Zerg player, because the Zerg players are just so weak into in, as if team games go long, because they just can't do anything. And so here we go, I think we've got the final push coming here, or probably the final push. And Eon is still doing an incredible job defending, but Insane is playing it clever and soaking up as many storms as he can with a small portion of his army before Tupacalypse comes in with his full army and hopefully supported by Testy. Alright, so we didn't get 7 0'd. Nice. No, we didn't. And I guess that makes us closer to the programmers than SC to GG is to us. Well, I think we already knew that without. Trying to prove it. Well, here's the proof right here for you, for all those doubters. By the way, I'm A plus on ICK. What, because you're 80% win rate at C minus? 89%? Bam! Yeah, that's a good one. By the way, I just made that up, I don't play ICK. And there we good go, job, GG. Boys. So Team Liquid managed to win one game out of seven. Impressive, considering we're up against <laughs> nice. B Team Pro Gamers right here. Well, I mean, it's got to be expected, right? <laughs> I mean, any other outcome, but close to seven-one is, is pretty much shocking. Yeah. Well, I, I expected seven-nil, but we managed to score one game, so that's that's got to count for something. I mean, there were a couple moments in there which looked impressive, but overall, you could probably put it down to lack of preparation really. So what we're doing next weekend is we're, we're bringing back one of our most beloved and ancient traditions. So a lot of you may be familiar with our with Liquibition. And so this week, this coming weekend 
the 13th of December, we're bringing back Liquid Edition for its 24th episode, and we're proud to announce that we will have JF, who you've already saw today, up against his TSL rival, Brat OK. Man, that's going to be sick. I'm so excited for their rematch, because Brat is a monster, and JF is a monster as well. Yeah, They've but got well, so back much in history. This, yeah, back in the semi-final match, it was it was three two, and the deciding match was Wuthering, and I know how much you hate Wuthering Heights. So this time they're getting to pick some of their maps, and hopefully it'll be a lot closer. And we've got seven games to duel it out, so it should be sick. Yeah, and that fifth deciding game was ridiculous. I don't know if you remember it, but uh, Brad OK did a two fact push, and it was actually inside Jeff's base, and Jeff somehow lived it. It was ridiculous. I mean, one misclick could have changed the entire TSL. You know, based on that match, so you know it's going to be crazy to see what happens this time. Exactly. So the news post should be up shortly, so you can get all the details there. But I guess for the the English cast of TL vs YG, we did we did well. One game at a at a seven ain't bad. So I guess this is it. Yep. All right, guys. Take care. So long. <laughs>